Good afternoon on this very rainy Monday. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I trust that you heard the President uh, speak at FEMA, uh, where he talked about uh, the hard work done uh, at that uh, agency on behalf of the American people, the hard work that continues there despite the effects of shutdown uh, there as elsewhere, uh, and on the, about the need for Congress to pass a budget, open the government, pass a bill so that the United States can pay its bills uh, and therefore uh, not continue to do uh, or threaten damage to our economy. Uh, before I take your questions, I just wanted to note that earlier today the President received another update on uh, the effects of the shutdown from Alyssa Mastromonaco, Rob Neighbors, and Sylvia Burwell. Uh, one of the uh, items that they noted is that in total we have now seen Head Start closures in six states, Alabama, Connecticut, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, and South Carolina, by seven grantees who operate approximately 100 centers and serve 7,200 children. Now this comes on top of the 57,000 children cut from Head Start this year in every state in the nation due to the harmful effects of sequestration. Again, the, there are multiple negative consequences to the shutdown of the government, the choice made by House Republicans to do this, uh, and uh, those effects are being felt in this the second week since they made that choice. Julie Pace. Thank you. Um, I know the President has said that he's willing to negotiate with Republicans on a variety of topics after they pass a clean CR and a clean debt ceiling. I'm wondering, though, if the White House would be willing to uh, somehow, in more specific terms, lay out what they're actually willing to negotiate on and maybe include it in a bill or somehow put it in sort of a non-negotiable way to give Speaker Boehner a little bit of cover to maybe take those two votes on the floor. Let me say two things about that, and I appreciate the question. One is, the President has laid out specifics about what he's willing to do and willing to negotiate well, sort of in his budget, terms. which is broad and specific. And the President said at the time when he released his budget that he knew he would not uh, get it passed uh, verbatim, that it, more negotiation and compromise would be required. Uh, but what is also required in this case is a willingness by Republicans to compromise and negotiate. And the President has been open to negotiation all year long, and he remains so today when it comes to how we make our choices to fund our priorities and our budget, do make those choices in a way that ensures our economy grows, Make, sh make those choices in a, in, in a way that ensures uh, that our economy grows uh, in a manner that most helps the middle class, because uh, the stronger our middle class, uh, the better the country does. Uh, that is what history has taught us. So, you know, the door has been open all year long, and, and you know, again and again and again, uh, Republicans uh, have, when it came to the process in the Senate and the House that they demanded, refused to appoint conferees for that regular order to continue and for the negotiations to take place there. And even in the meetings with the President, some of which were very productive and thoughtful, uh, Republican lawmakers never came back with a compromise proposal of their own. But he is ready to do that, just not under threat of shutdown, not under threat of default. Uh, those are fundamental core responsibilities of Congress that they need to fulfill, uh, and he won't, you know, allow the American people and the economy and the American economy to be held hostage uh, to ideological demands uh, in return for fulfilling those simple functions. Let me also say that when it comes to putting a bill on the floor of the House, which the Speaker could do today to reopen the government, because Apparently, everyone but the Speaker is confident that that bill would receive a majority in the House and would receive votes from uh, Republicans as well as Democrats. That would be simply doing, uh, would be simply extending government funding at levels that Republicans set. Let's, let's be clear that Democrats, in going along with 
a temporary continuing resolution to ensure the government wouldn't shut down and now to ensure that it would reopen uh, and allow time for further negotiations uh, is not some sort of you know, fulfillment of democratic priorities. You know that. Everybody here who covers the budgets know, knows that. Uh, Democrats and the President have asked for and believe it, it's necessary to have additional funding beyond the level set by uh, the CR, but have made no demands associated with that. None whatsoever. Zero. You guys have been saying this now. We're going into the second week, as you mm -hmm. said. You were making these points before the government shut down, and it doesn't seem to be having a lot of <coughs> impact on Speaker Boehner. And I, I understand, you know, all the points that you're making, mm -hmm. but given that the politics in the House seem to be making it difficult for him to put a clean CR on the floor, does the President feel like there is anything he can do to lay out something specific, make some kind of promise to Boehner and House Republicans of negotiations afterwards, something specific that they want that would give Boehner the political cover to take this step? Your question contains within it, I think, the essence of why Americans hate the dysfunction here. Because the suggestion is that the Speaker of the House can't do the obvious and right thing because of his internal party politics. That, that this has to do that this has to do with, you know, his job as opposed to the jobs of those who've been furloughed, or the jobs of those uh, Americans uh, who would be out of work if we were to allow, or the House Republicans and the Republicans in Congress were uh, to allow the unthinkable, which is a default on our obligations. And I, and I, and I hope and you know, don't want to believe that that's the case. That. You know, the Republicans and, and Speaker have, have said, you know, they've, they've staked out their position that they insist on getting something out of this, some extracting some political concession uh, in return for opening the people's government, in return for paying the bills they racked, racked up. And what the President's saying is we can't do that because that would be uh, putting in jeopardy the, the stability of our economy for the long term. And uh, it would do great harm to our democratic system if every time it was necessary for the United States to take action to pay its obligations, uh, a minority in Congress, a faction of one party in one house, of one branch of government could uh, make a series of ideological demands and refuse to pay our bills if they didn't get it. And that would be regardless of party. That would be true if a Republican were sitting in the Oval Office <clears throat> and the roles were reversed. It, it's, it's a precedent that uh, should not and must not be set. Just on the, um, the raids this weekend, uh, can you say who is questioning the uh, suspect that was picked up in Libya and what the benefits are of questioning him in international waters? Well, I, I can obviously uh, confirm that uh, that Mr. You know, Abu Anas al Libya was uh, arrested and that he is in U.S. custody. I don't have more details for you uh, about uh, where he is. Uh, the operations were conducted, as you know, by the U.S. military under the authority conferred by the authorization to use military force from 2001, which authorizes the use of military force against al Qaeda and associated forces. Uh, you know, this. <clears throat> operation was made possible by the superb work and coordination across our national security agencies and the intelligence uh, community. The uh, fact of the matter is, is that Abu Anas al-Libi has been indicted in the Southern District of New York in connection with his alleged role in al-Qaeda's conspiracy to kill U.S. nationals and to conduct attacks against U.S. interests worldwide, which included Al-Qaeda plots to attack U.S. forces stationed in Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and Somalia, as well as the U.S. embassies in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, and so that uh, indictment has been pending. And uh, you know we believe in a system that uh, brings people to justice through uh, through indictment and. And that's what uh, you know we're witnessing now. Yep. Jay, thank you. Um, uh, earlier today, um, National Economic Council Director Gene Sperling uh, didn't wouldn't rule out the possibility of a uh, a debt 
limit increase that would last for only two or three weeks to give a short amount of time, presumably <coughs> to talk further. Um, would you, would the president accept something like that? Is that something you'd see as possible? Well, I appreciate the question because there's been some, I think, particular misunderstanding about this. We don't, at the White House, uh, get to raise the debt ceiling. We don't get to set the uh, time frame uh, under which the debt ceiling is raised or the duration uh, of the uh, raising of the debt ceiling. It is our view, as I think both those uh, officials stated this morning, that uh, since the whole purpose of this argument is to remove uncertainty, the uncertainty created by the threat of default, the threat of not raising the debt ceiling, that the longer you raise the debt ceiling for, the better. And we would support efforts underway uh, in the Senate by Senate Democrats to uh, move a bill, a clean bill, that would raise the debt ceiling for a year. Uh, that would certainly uh, be viewed here as uh, something we could support. Uh, but uh, we don't get to make those determinations. What our position has always been has not been raise it for a certain amount of time. Uh, it has been uh, raise the debt ceiling without drama and delay. So whatever the duration, uh, our position will not change, which is raise it uh, so that the United States can continue to pay its bills and continue to uh, ensure that the world knows that we are good to our word and that we fulfill our obligations. Uh, and when it comes up again, our position will still be we will not negotiate over Congress's responsibility, sole responsibility, uh, to pay the bills that Congress racked up. Uh, so the hope, I mean, so I think the way to view this is really around the issue of certainty. And I think there's a, an instructive uh, past experience in our recent past here to demonstrate how this works. In 2011, Republicans in Congress decided really for the first time in our history to threaten default if they didn't get what they wanted out of negotiations over the budget. Uh, and that threat, once people realized it was real, caused significant harm to our economy. Uh, default did not happen, uh, but the threat of it caused harm. I mean, it was measurable harm, and it included a downgrading of the United States for the first time in our history. Uh, eight months ago, the Congress, essentially the same Congress, extended the debt ceiling uh, without drama, without delay, without, you know, making a lot of ideological demands. Uh, and they did it until, you know, for a period of time that we're now running up against now. But I think if you look at that period when they raised it earlier this year, you saw that not only were there no harmful effects to our economy, there were positive impacts. If you can uh, acknowledge that the lack of drama, the lack of uncertainty about raising the debt ceiling uh, contributed to the sustained economic growth that we've seen and contributed to the significant job creation we've seen this year. There's, 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 so the, we saw what happened when you mess around with this, when you threaten default in 2011, and you saw what happened when Congress does what it has traditionally done, which is raise the debt ceiling without making these kinds of threats. Uh, so certainty is what it's about in our view. Yes, Speaker Boehner this weekend said that there would be no uh, increase in the debt limit without concessions from the President. Can you comment on that? Contradicting a host of, time, uh, a host of occasions where he himself has said we would never default. Republican leaders in the Senate and the House have long said that they would never allow us to default. And now we see uh, the leader of the Republican Party on Capitol Hill saying that uh, he will not raise the debt ceiling if Republicans do not get what they want. That's highly reckless, reckless and irresponsible. It is uh, astounding, really, if you think about it, on October 7th, given how little time there is left, that the Speaker of the House is announcing to the world that he will not allow a bill to raise the debt ceiling to pass uh, if Republicans don't get their specific demands. Uh, that's, that's very. Saying, hey, hey, John. I'm having a conversation here. I'll, I'm sure I'll call with. I'm sure that you'll represent what the speaker's saying in a minute. But, uh, but no. Okay. He he said that he would not. He, I think Mark, you asked the question. Why don't you why don't you why don't you say what is your understanding that the speaker said? 
the speaker apparently said that it is no still the case that he <coughs> will not uh, uh, raise the debt ceiling without concessions from the president. And I was asking you to comment on that. Mm -hmm. And our position is, this is too important to attach political demands, demand political concessions, uh, in return for fulfilling the responsibility uh, by Congress to ensure we pay our debts and we do not default. Can I just also ask yeah. about uh, the raids over the weekend? Um, apparently the raid in Somalia uh, failed to capture the intended target. Can you uh, talk about whether the President ordered that specific raid and whether he was disappointed in the outcome? Well, I can say that the, the President approved both operations uh, in both Libya and Somalia. I think it's important to note that although they occurred at the same time, uh, these were separate operations approved separately. Uh, and uh, when an approval like this happens, there is obviously discretion given to uh, commanders as to when they uh, initiate and fulfill uh, those missions. Uh, so it is a coincidence that they happened at the same time. Uh, and I think it's important because there's a lot of conflation of the two uh, to make that point. Uh, separately, on, on the uh, mission in Somalia, most, most, of, uh, question, most of the questions about it I would refer to uh, the Department of uh, Defense, but I can confirm that on October 4th, U.S. Mi military personnel were involved in, in a counterterrorism operation against a known al-Shabaab terrorist. And as you know and has been reported, no U.S. personnel were injured or killed. Uh, and uh, again, for more information about that operation, I would refer you to the Department of Defense. Jim. Uh, I'll let uh, John pressure on what uh, the speaker said, but uh, it, I mean, it's fair to say, though, it would help. <coughs> If you had a short-term debt ceiling increase to turn down the temperature, give both sides a little room to yeah. talk about this. Jim, and I, I think I'm glad that you're asking because I know that you've been uh, remarking upon this as if it's huge news. The our I, no, I no, but but that's not the case. But I, seriously, it's I it's. My but I may but, not be, uh, but I understand it's been out there that that our position has never been to say that the debt ceiling ought to be raised for a certain period of time. Our position is ought to be, has been from the beginning that the debt ceiling ought to be raised uh, without drama or delay, and that the problem around these votes has always been uh, the, the uncertainty created by threats, at least in 2011 and this year, by Republicans not to raise the debt ceiling, not, fulfill, not to fulfill their uh, obligations here to ensure that the United States doesn't default unless they get what they want and they have a list of demands. Uh, so, again, so I think that what uh, you would my like two to colleagues talk us out of reporting, you'd like to talk us out of reporting no, that not. there might be some kind of conciliatory language coming out of this White House with respect to a, a debt ceiling increase of whatever length. All, might be all I'm saying out. is that uh, if, you're, if you're saying if you want to talk us out of that, no, no, go I, right ahead. That's your. No, your I'm podium. simply saying that we uh, we have never stated, and we're not saying today that a debt ceiling ought to be or can be any particular length of time. It is our view that. The longer a, uh, a a longer debt ceiling increase, a more substantial debt ceiling increase that then uh, averts another kind of uh, confrontation like this for a longer period of time is a good thing, and we would support uh, what uh, Senate Democrats are initiating now, which is a, a bill that would uh, extend the debt ceiling for for uh, for a year. But whether it's for that period of time or a shorter period of time. What will not change is the, Cong uh, the President's view that uh, he cannot and must not uh, allow for you know, a, a ransom situation to occur when it comes to that fulfilling that responsibility. So uh, you know, he, will not, he, he will make no demands from Congress, will ask for nothing from Congress in return for Congress raising the debt ceiling. Uh, and that will be true this time, and it will be true next time, whenever that is. So I'm not, I'm not ruling out a specific duration, and I want to make that clear. I'm just saying that actually our view is that the longer is better because we continue to have these, uh, or we, at least of late, continue to have these uh, suggestions from Republicans that, that, that they would threaten default if they don't uh, get what they want. And I think that Congress, whenever it reaches a determination about what it's going to do here and in terms of how long they will raise the debt ceiling, you know, it has to take into consideration also when they want to have to deal with this themselves. I mean, it's no mystery to those who've covered the Congress or understand how it works, how uh, those who have worked there that, 
you know, this is not a pleasant vote for a lot of members. Uh, and uh, in the past, there have been uh, uh, times when Congress has increased the debt ceiling for a longer duration for that reason, as well as some of the others that I mentioned. And Jake, does this administration know what a debt default would look like? It would look bad, Jim. I think so we it, know what, from- What would it look like? Uh, look, I think that there are independent reports out there about what the consequences of default would be. Uh, I would refer you to the Department of Treasury uh, for more information about our view. But, you know, we're not, you know, we're hard pressed to say with any specificity, uh, you know, what the catastrophe would look like since it's never occurred before. Uh, we know from the 2011 experience, and we, you saw the report from the Treasury last week, uh, what even the threat of default can do to our economy, uh, can do to our economic growth and our job creation what it can do to confidence and uh, the willingness of investors globally to uh, invest in the United States. So, you know, we know those consequences would be severe. I don't think anybody who's credible doubts that. When you hear some talk about uh, suggesting the idea that uh, somehow default would not be so bad, they, they really, um, they're really wrong. And I don't think uh, any credible economist or uh, financial institution would, uh, would take those kinds of claims seriously. Because Tom Coburn, as you know, who's been close with the President over the years, uh, said that we won't go into default on October 17th if we hit the debt ceiling and go over it. Um, is he wrong? Yes. Because, you look, I mean, I, I don't know if he's talking about prioritization, but prioritization is default by another name. If you pay some of your bills, but not, not all your bills, you're in default on the bills you don't pay, period. And when you're the United States of America, well, well not, let's keep it local here. If you pay some of your bills, but not all of your bills, you're in default on the bills you didn't pay. Moreover, your credit rating becomes worthless, even though you've paid some of your bills, but because you haven't paid the other one. So the next time you try to get a loan, uh, you can say, well, I, I kept paying my mortgage. I know I didn't pay. Uh, the phone company and the, and, and the, the, the uh, you know, electrical company and probably didn't pay my cable bill, but I paid my mortgage. And, and they're going to say, well, you got to pay all your bills. That's how you maintain credit worthiness. So the fact of the matter is prioritization is default. And uh, as the Treasury Department has laid out, uh, you know, they run out of measures uh, to postpone default. Uh, and uh, that will create a scenario that we've never experienced before if, if the House, if the Congress, and the Republicans in the Congress do not fulfill their responsibility to ensure that we pay our bills. John. Jay, would the President be willing to negotiate uh, a situation where the, there would no longer be the threat of, uh, of a debt limit increase, in other words, where Republicans would offer in exchange for a negotiation that we would have a permanent increase uh, in the debt ceiling. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure that that offer is available or on the table, and I'm not sure what you mean exactly. If the if the Republicans act and and allow the Congress to act to raise the debt ceiling for whatever duration, uh, that obviously meets the condition the president has set, and then he is willing to negotiate. And uh, assuming they also act to reopen the government, but then he, that that creates the uh, situation that the president says, yes, he will negotiate, yes, because he has been. That's the, the, the thing that is so important to remember, is that the president's been negotiating and, and demonstrated a willingness to negotiate all year long. And in a process that Republicans demand, demanded at the time, must take place, uh, when it came to Congress passing budgets, the House and the Senate passing budgets, and then uh, those budgets, which obviously were different, the one in the Senate and the one in the House, being uh, you know, reconciled through a conference, uh, the President said, okay, let's do that. And the Democrats in the Senate said, okay, let's do that. Uh, and that was a principal demand of Republicans in the negotiations last year. Uh, and of course, once we did what they asked, they then for refused to do what they said they wanted to do, which was uh, allow a conference to take place where those budgets could be hammered out and the differences could be uh, eliminated and a compromise could be reached. Uh, the President is, is very eager to start that process again. 
but not under threat of default and not under threat of continued shutdown. So, so to go back to what the speaker said is that he, they are not going to pass a clean debt limit increase. They aren't, they didn't, he didn't give a specific set of demands that actually have to be met, but he said he's not going to have a clean debt limit increase. If the Speaker of the House sticks to that position, are we going into default? Uh, like you'd have to ask the Speaker of the House. No, no I'm asking if he, sticks, if he sticks to that position, well, if the Speaker all, does John, not move from that position, are we going to default? If you're saying if the Speaker attaches to the debt ceiling increase uh, a recognition of, you know, uh, you know, the importance of motherhood, we might, you know, accept that. But uh, what That's you're saying, I'm, I'm trying to be funny, but nobody laughs, so I apologize. <laughs> it's been a long shutdown already. But the, here's, the, here's the, no, we will not, we're not going to negotiate over the con Congress's responsibility to raise the debt ceiling. So if he's, what he, ha what he and others in his leadership have said is that they want concessions from the President presumably because they couldn't get them through the other legislative or electoral means, concessions from the President in return for raising the debt ceiling. That dynamic uh, amounts to, a, you know, an attempt to extort from the executive branch and from the Democrats in Congress uh, concessions in order to prevent default. And, and that's off the table. We're not going to, we're not doing that because the damage to our economy in the long term and to the ability of this president and future, uh, I mean, this president's successors and future Congresses to ensure that we do not become a laughing stock internationally because we either come to the verge or brink of default every quarter or every year, or we do default every quarter or every year, you know, we cannot have that. So the president is making clear that uh, he, he, you know, he's not asking for anything in return from Congress. Uh, for, you know, for Congress to do its job when it comes to opening the government at levels of spending Republicans set, and he's not asking for anything in return from Congress uh, for Congress to do its job in paying our bills. So we do go to default. Well, again, if, if, if they don't move from that the, the, the President's position is clear. The Republican position has changed uh, with, you know, every new day on the calendar. So I don't know, uh, I can't predict where the Speaker will be. What I can say is the President's position has been consistent from the beginning. And if I can just do um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, two quick ones. Sure. Uh, w w was the Speaker of the House not telling the truth when he said there aren't the votes to pass a clean funding bill? Uh, well, we don't, haven't done any whip counts here, uh, among, uh, especially among <laughs> Republicans. I am simply noting that it, there have been published accounts of, uh, I think, more than 20 now House Republicans who said they would vote. Okay, ABC has 21. Uh, so, of House Republicans that have said on the record in public that they would vote for a clean CR, the one that passed the Senate already. Uh, if you add that to the Democrats who would vote for a clean CR, uh, you have the majority you need. And I, I, I would note that other Republican members of the House, uh, as well as other Republican commentators and political folks who know a lot about uh, the Republicans in the House have said uh, that at least that many would vote for a clean CR if the House Speaker would allow it to come to the floor. And so we, you know, as as I think we responded over the weekend or, or, or yesterday when the Speaker said that, I think he should, if, if he doesn't believe, you know, if he's sure that he's right, that the majority doesn't exist, then he should put it to the to a vote. Why not vote? I mean, just vote, right? What's the we could resolve this, both the dispute over whether, you know, who's right and who's wrong if there's a majority, which is uh, a smaller dispute, uh, and we could resolve the shutdown if you would simply allow it to come to a vote. And could you have an estimate uh, on how many people have attempted to access the, uh, uh, the website for the health care? Let me see. I, uh, let me uh, see what facts and figures I have. Uh, as of now, I still have, uh, in the first 72 hours, uh, healthcare.gov had over 8.6 million unique uh, visitors. As you know, there were seven times more users on the Marketplace website uh, that first morning than have ever been on the Medicare.gov uh, site at one time. But you still don't know how many people have signed up? We, I, I'm glad you asked that question because uh, I want to be uh, clear about it. Uh, when it comes to enrollment data, you know, I want to clear this up. 
we will release data on regular, regular monthly intervals, just like uh, was done in Massachusetts and just like what was done and is done when it comes to Medicare Part D. Uh, what I can confirm right now is that people are signing up through federal exchanges. Um, but we're not going to be really, you know, we're, this is an aggregation process and we're not going to release data on an hourly or daily or weekly basis. We'll follow models that have existed in previous programs, including uh, a similar program in Massachusetts, including Medicare Part D, which is the most recent federal example of this kind of thing, and release uh, enrollment data uh, on regularly monthly intervals. Well, you can give us numbers of traffic, how many people go to the website, but not how many people Again, this is, these are, these are, this is large volume. There's no question that there's large volume. And, we're, and these are rough estimates about the volume. Uh, one of the reasons why we've been able to, or why we've provided the information about the volume is because that it is the principal reason why we've had slowdowns and, and other issues that we've had to try to resolve uh, to make the consumer experience better. Major. Okay, you've often mentioned the January experience of raising the debt ceiling. As you are probably aware, there was a rough agreement to have a sidecar understanding with the raising of the debt ceiling. Said the Democrats would have a budget resolution. If they didn't pass it, they wouldn't get their pay. It wasn't attached to the debt ceiling, but it was a sidecar understanding. And these things moved simultaneously, though the debt ceiling was clean. Mm -hmm. Using that as a model, is that something the White House would be open to in that? Sidecars? Yes. I mean, it's, it's, not a, it's not a brand new legislative technique. Sure, you sure. saw it. You covered it when well, you were there. Look, I, I, did when I, was there I think, well. let me be clear, what I, what, and, I, and I think it's an important question, uh, that our position has been that the Congress uh, ought to raise the debt ceiling uh, without drama or delay. Okay? And, and so how they do that, and I've answered this in different ways when it comes to past Congresses and past years when the debt ceiling has been raised without drama or delay and right. been attached to but something. Been so this January example. Correct. But, but, but you're talking about the distinction between clean versus without drama and delay or delay. And, and, and the point I've made is that uh, it is true that in the past, prior to 2011, there have been times when the raising of the debt ceiling has been attached to something, but there hasn't been a threat made by one part or the other to uh, withhold uh, payment or, you know, allow for default if they don't get what they want. Right. So I'm not going to... This case is one where Republicans had a policy priority and a procedural priority. Mm -hmm. Senate Democrats pass a budget. Please don't repeat all that. I know the drill about them doing that. Yeah. But so they achieved something that they wanted as they were Bears having repeating. a discussion. <laughs> but I, I, I remember Thank I you. I won't. Yeah. Um, so they achieved something that they were seeking that was unrelated to the debt ceiling, and it was all within the same legislative neighborhood, if you understand what I'm saying. Is that something that can be achieved in this context? What I will say, because I think this goes to the, the issue that I'm, I think. It's not a what, pure negotiation sure, on the question sure. itself, but other things can be added what in. What I will say is we can support put the, process the effort uh, that, that is being worked on now by Senate Democrats uh, for a clean bill raising the debt ceiling. Our overall position has always been uh, that Congress needs to uh, raise the debt ceiling so that the United States can pay the bills that Congress racked up without drama or delay. And how they do that, I'm not going to specify or rule in anything or rule out anything. What I can say is that, you know, we're not going to negotiate over a set of ideological demands for concessions from the President or concessions on uh, spending priorities uh, in return for Congress fulfilling this fundamental responsibility. As I've said in the past, how Congress fulfills it, as long as they fulfill it, without drama or delay, without brinksmanship, without threatening default, uh, is up to them. And, and the duration that they attach to it, again, is up to them. And as you know, the duration is not just a policy question, it can sometimes be a political question, because the longer you extend it, the more money is being added to the debt ceiling. I know it's not an appropriation, mm -hmm. but in, in some constituents' minds, for some of these members, it sounds like it. And so there's a political price that they're fear of paying if they go for a year as opposed to two weeks or three weeks. And by you saying today two weeks or three weeks is acceptable does send a signal to the Congress. And is that the signal you're intending to send? No, I, as I was trying to explain to Jim, we are not trying to send a signal about the, anything about the duration beyond that uh, we do support the efforts underway in the you Senate. Would say you but would sign anything that's that short if you wanted to. What we will say is that whether uh, it's today or a number of weeks from now, or a number of months from now, or a number of years from now, it will always be Congress's responsibility to raise our debt ceiling so that 
the United States can pay the bills that Congress has incurred. Uh, and it will always be, as long as he's president, President Obama's position, uh, that uh, that responsibility uh, is not negotiable. It's not, it's not, they're, they're not, there's not a game of, uh, you know, trading for political priorities or agenda items that in this case, uh, you know, Republicans have not been able to achieve through legislation or uh, through the ballot box. What is the policy reason not to take up the House Republican offer on the case of FEMA to have that appropriation put forward and signed, <coughs> considering what the President went through and the country went through this weekend, and the fact the President said we dodged a bullet, but there may be more bullets, and mm -hmm. FEMA ought to be up and ready and, and under all circumstances? What's well, the policy all, reason? Well, here, here, when it comes to response to disasters, there is a fund uh, that is funded that's available that's separate from the shutdown process, and we've made that clear in, in, in the run-up to uh, that tropical storm, and it's possible negative uh, consequences for the United States, and as well as other severe weather incidents that may occur. All of this piecemeal stuff uh, begs the question that it, the simple way, it begs the question, why not just open the government? If, if, if you're going to, you know, say this is okay and that's okay and this is okay, some of the things that they say is, are okay because they've been raised in the media by you guys about impacts, whether it's NIH or FEMA. Uh, you know, are, are, are things that in other situations they're desperate to cut, SNAP funding, for example. Uh, the, our position is open the government. Open the government. Why, you know, why, why play these games? Just open the government, continue it, the funding levels at levels that Republicans embraced, uh, in many cases with great enthusiasm, uh, so that we can then uh, continue to discuss our uh, longer term budget deal, uh, not with the government shut down and not with the threat of a shutdown. One last thing before I mm -hmm. let you go. Sure. Um, I'm not a computer programmer, I'm not a specialist in writing code, but there are lots of people out in the country who have been blogging about this for the last three or four days, some of whom are very sympathetic to the Affordable Care Act, not hostile to its implementation, and actually believe that yes, there is a problem with very strong curiosity and people logging onto the system, but they also have detected through some pretty simple forensic work on their own that this is a failed system, that it's mm -hmm. coded improperly, that basic sort of fundamental steps that should have been anticipated and built into a large government system like this simply don't exist or don't exist to near the capacity they ought to. Is it too early to talk about this particular rollout as being systematically flawed in its construction? What I can tell you is that our top issue when it comes to the glitches has been the extraordinary number of people coming to check out plans and find out more about Obamacare. And, that, and the number has uh, obviously exceeded expectations. Traffic on the website and at the call center continues to be high, uh, suggesting a sustained interest by consumers in their health care options. Now, getting to your question, you know, nothing like this has been done before, but peak levels of Medicare enrollment, concurrent users were one-eighth of the concurrent traffic on health care got to go. Anticipate that those numbers would be much smaller than this rollout, wouldn't you? I mean, Medicare is a discrete audience that has discrete user curiosity. This is a rollout right at the beginning. Wouldn't you have assumed but there would be this huge interest and you should build a system ready for it? Well, I mean, I, if we had listened to Republicans, I think the assumption is nobody would have enrolled, nobody would have called, but nobody would have... I mean, that, so, you, so you have to consult answer, other people when you build the system, but, not congressional But, but the answer is that there has been uh, unexpectedly high uh, levels of interest, and we are taking action every day. Uh, that is the principal reason that there's a problem. Now, when traffic hit healthcare.gov at this level, a particular component of the system within the account registration function was not able to handle that level of volume, creating issues that consumers experienced when going through the registration process. CMS has put up a gate at the front end of the system that places visitors into a waiting room and lets them in at a particular pace so that the surge in volume does not uh, caused the problems that it caused in the past. CMS has simultaneously been working intensively around the clock uh, to address the drivers of this issue. Uh, and thus far, we've reduced waiting uh, room times by a third and are increasingly moving more users through the system. Uh, but we're not satisfied with the performance. We can do better. And to make further improvements, we are doing several things at once, including adding server capacity and making software changes to make the system more efficient to handle higher volume. I think this addressed some, I too am not an uh, expert in the field, uh, but I think that, that, that what, what you can expect is that the folks at CMS, the folks at HHS who are uh, 
uh, running this are working around the clock and addressing all of the issues that have uh, arisen because of the high interest that, uh, and the high volume that we've seen. Okay. Jay, on the debt ceiling, to kind of sum up the series of questions you got on that, whether it's two weeks, three weeks, three months, since you've said repeatedly it doesn't, you've never demanded a specific duration of lifting the debt ceiling. If there's a shorter term debt ceiling lift, will the President sign it? Again, I'm not going to negotiate. Uh, we think that the Congress ought to raise the debt ceiling without drama or delay. Uh, if they do that, that's a great thing. It's up to them to set the duration of that. What we think is a bad thing is to, is that to, to, to create an expectation that uh, somehow it's okay to do it without drama or delay now and then threaten default in three weeks or a month or six months. That would not be acceptable either. So our position, and just so I make clear, is that we do uh, support the efforts in the Senate by Democrats to uh, pass a bill that would raise it for a more extended period of time. Uh, but the broader, uh, the, I mean, that's our view of a specific option being explored right now. The broader position is raise it without threatening default. Right. Do it the way you did it in January when there were no ideological demands attached. There was no threat of default. There was nobody saying, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, shutdown is just a, uh, you know, a precursor to the, to, to something even better, which is a, you know, a paraphrase that you hear from some who seem to relish the opportunity to see the United States default because they imagine that somehow that will be good, as if economic contraction globally, potentially, uh, would do anything but create enormous harm for the American people, enormous harm for the American economy, uh, and shrink our capacity to pay our bills even more. So uh, without drama and delay, that's our position. Right. So then my real question is, if it is without drama and delay, whether it's a month or two months, whatever it is, does that provide, if default is taken off the table, as you say, does that provide the time and space for there to finally be the negotiations you laid out, I think the President said it at FEMA, I'll talk about health care, I'll talk about energy policy. I think the key question is, does that provide the time and space finally and to I think, negotiate? I think, I think that if we got to the point where there was, uh, we, Congress was on the verge of passing something as opposed to folks in this room and your counterparts on Capitol Hill floating this and floating that, we could answer with more specificity about, A, uh, are they serious about raising the debt ceiling without threatening default? And B, are they serious about moving forward with uh, the kind of negotiations the President's been open to all year long? Uh, and hopefully we'll get to that point. Because you used the word certainty before, so I'm trying to get at, mm -hmm. can you provide that certainty? If John Boehner's not willing to do it, that's his issue. Are you willing to provide the certainty from this podium that if there is time and space with some kind of even short-term debt ceiling increase, that there is some certainty for the market, for the American people, that there will be a negotiation to try to come up with a the, broader the budget. The President has said all along and said again today that he is willing and ready uh, and eager to sit down with lawmakers to discuss our longer term budget priorities and how we fund our government in a way that uh, enhances economic growth, enhances job creation, protects the middle class, invests in key and vital areas. Uh, and continues the project of reducing our deficit in a responsible way. Okay, last one. Uh, over the weekend, there was an issue about the Amber Alert website. You received criticism that it, it was shut down initially, it went back up, and it led to these charges from Republicans that you're, you're, the government is somehow picking and choosing things that make it more painful so that the public will put more pressure on Congress to act, to reopen the government. Can you comment on that? Well, A, that's of course not the case. Uh, B, I would refer you to DOJ about how this is, uh, the, the website is administered, but I can tell you that the website that DOJ uh, maintains is informational, and it's not a law enforcement to tool used to issue Amber Alerts, and at no point during the shutdown has the Amber Alert system been in interrupted. Uh, but in terms, you know, as you know, it's been... The, it's state by state. Is well, I, I, that I, issued. I, I would not, uh, I would hesitate to... Uh, give details that, that, uh, that I think are best answered by DOJ, but to eliminate any confusion among the public about the status of the program, a furloughed Justice Department employee was called into work in order to restore the informational site. But again, it's informational. The, the system itself uh, was never interrupted, uh, and I think that's important for people to know and to report. Yep. Um, the, uh, 
to button up. The President, you are not issuing a veto. This is the President's not issuing a veto threat if it's a short term. Well, well, first of all, we don't in introduce veto threats for propositions thrown forward from the briefing room or some. I don't see. Do you see a, a, a bill to extend the debt ceiling uh, currently under consideration by the House of Representatives? So I can't, I mean, I'm not going to speculate about that. Our it's clear you're not ruling it out. And it's clear you guys, you're, you're trying to give a lot of room here. Mm -hmm. It seems to me, I mean, everything I'm hearing, you're giving Boehner plenty of room. If he wanted to do the six-week breather, clean CR, clean debt ceiling, it doesn't sound like you guys would refuse to sign that. Well, I think it's fair to say that we simply believe Congress ought to take this responsibility seriously and fulfill it uh, without threatening default. And, you know, how they do that is up to them. And how often they want to vote on it so we're, we're is up to them. This correctly, then. This is a correct interpretation. Well, I think it's correct you don't to have say a demand that I'm not, frame. Setting, I'm not setting a time frame on it. I, you know, I think that when it comes to the issue of the full faith and credit of the United States and creating uh, doubts about that as opposed to reinforcing confidence about that, uh, Congress ought to consider how it acts because, you know, you, what if you raise the debt ceiling for an hour? I mean, that probably wouldn't solve the problem, would it? So, you know, y y y this is an issue about, uh, that goes to the heart of our place, the United States' place, in the world economy and the way that we are viewed uh, as a bedrock and as the most reliable uh, partner and the most reliable place to invest. And, and because of that, uh, we have, uh, you know, the economic strength that we have internationally. So uh, Congress ought not to threaten that. And uh, they ought to take actions, whatever actions they do take, to raise the debt ceiling in a manner uh, that removes that threat. All right, Chuck Hagel ordered uh, furloughed workers back to work uh, today. Uh, why not do that in other parts of the government? Uh, again, there are issues that go to uh, security uh, that are particular to the Department of Defense and particular to the fact that we have active missions abroad. And I think Secretary Hagel has addressed this. Uh, the answer here is not the piecemeal, when you talk about the broader shutdown here, is the piecemeal uh, accepting of individuals or the piecemeal passage of uh, legislation that addresses a small part of the problem. The answer is to reopen the government at levels set by Republicans, levels that they thought were great at the time, uh, and, and then get about the business of negotiating, negotiating a longer-term uh, budget deal. I, well, I'm not a lawyer, but I think that uh, the answer is probably, you know, th there's, a, there's a law in place here and, and, the, the, and statutes in place and regulations in place when it comes to a shutdown that obviously uh, govern how a shutdown is administered. So it's, uh, you know, it, again, we live in a, uh, in a world, in a democracy where powers are divided between branches of government, and, one, and the powers that reside with Congress appropriately uh, include funding the government. They include uh, the responsibility, the power and responsibility to pay the debts of the United States. And those are powers and responsibilities that uh, ought to be taken seriously and not to be um, uh, treated with uh, anything but great caution. Was an, uh, going to Ali B a minute, was, mm -hmm. an attempt, was there an attempt to ask the Libyan government to extradite? Uh, well, I, what I can tell you is that we're in regular communication with the Libyan government uh, on a range of security and counterterrorism issues, and uh, we don't get into the specifics of those communications. Uh, we value our relationship with the new Libya uh, and support the aspirations of the Libyan people as they participate in their democratic transition after 42 long years of dictatorship. Uh, so. You know, we'll continue to work with Libya and its other international partners to strengthen that democratic transition and support Libya as it b rebuilds the country's institutions. But, uh, you know, on the issue of uh, communications on the specific matter, you know, we're not going to get into specific you communications. You told the Libyan government that you were doing I this say, I can say that we consult regularly with the Libyan government on a range of security and counterterrorism issues. And to the fact of whether the Libyan what government I can tell you is that we beforehand. consult regularly with them, exactly and I'm not going to comment. Answer. Uh, on the specifics of our, uh, of our communications with a foreign government. The President said in a speech at National Defense University that he thought the, the, the use of force that you just cited earlier as, you, as the sort of legal means as to why you were able to snatch this guy off the street um, was too broad and that he wanted to negotiate 
uh, a narrowing of it or even the possible elimination of it with Congress? Do you have any update on the status of those negotiations? Uh, well, I'm sure that uh, we here would uh, very much look forward to having those uh, consultations and negotiations uh, uh, more intensively with Congress uh, if we could get to the point where Congress would reopen the government and raise the debt ceiling. Uh, so that we weren't all preoccupied with we shut down, shut down and uh, look, I think there, there are attempts to look, try to are, wind I, down the, uh, the use of force. Uh, look, I think that, that there are all sorts of regular communications and consultations with Congress on these kinds of like, substantive serious matters. Uh, and, and often, uh, to everyone's credit, including uh, Republicans on Capitol Hill, those, those kind of conversations you know, tend to take place uh, without the sort of partisan uh, you know, frills attached, which is a good thing. Uh, but I don't have a status update on that. What I can tell you that this, is that this operation clearly fell within the AUMF, and it, and it represents our Approach you say to it clearly fell. I mean, you say it clearly fell it was an operation. This guy is a, uh, made this attack, masterminded this attack in 1998 before there wasn't before this existed. Right, right. and you say he was indicted in 2000, and the AOMF was passed in 2001, and it and he is clearly uh, Al Qaeda, and he is clearly wanted on uh, charges uh, that I enumerated before, uh, and it is our position that when we are when we are able to, uh, we prefer to capture someone like. Uh, Mr. Alibi, and that's what we did in this case. Thank Peter. Does the um, president have some sympathy for lawmakers who are insisting on negotiation over the debt ceiling, given that he himself as a senator voted against raising the debt ceiling? Uh, that's a golden oldie, but Peter, I think that the president has addressed that many times. And what the president did not do, did not do, was uh, vow that the debt ceiling ought not be raised and that the, co the country ought to default for the first time in history uh, if he didn't get his way. Uh, and he would not have done that. And I think that uh, this goes to the whole point of the history here, which is that it is, it is a fact that 45 roughly times since Ronald Reagan became president, the debt ceiling has been raised by Congress. And they have done it in a variety of ways, either as standalone uh, bills or attached to other bills. But only in 2011 was uh, a process engaged in where one party uh, decided to use the raising of the debt ceiling uh, as leverage to try to get political demands to the point where they threatened default. And as we noted in the report uh, put out by Treasury last week, there were profound negative consequences to that strategy. And uh, that is why the President has taken the position he's taken. Does the um, President believe that given the calamitous consequences of default, as he's laid them out, that this should continue to be raising the debt ceiling? Should that be a congressional prerogative? Or would you be interested in some sort of legal recourse to take this out of the hands of Congress? Well, again, it is, in either case, was well, not a legal recourse. First of all, if, you're, if, you're, if that's a circuitous way of asking me about the 14th Amendment, or something, our position has been stated and restated again that we do not believe that the President has that authority. Uh, moreover, even if he asserted it, the uncertainty around it would, would render it uh, uh, ineffective. So. Our position is, I mean, we, you know, the Constitution is what it is and has clearly given, and it is, you know, the, and it is, sort of you understand. The fall thing. Well, I'm not saying <laughs> that uh, it's anything but uh, the world's greatest time. The world's greatest yeah, There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it does assign to Congress the power and responsibility to pay the debts of the United States. And then uh, the so-called debt ceiling mechanism was created in the early part of the 20th century uh, as a means of dealing with that power and responsibility. Uh, how, you know, how Congress moves forward on this is, of course, up to Congress. Nothing that we say or do, it's not a legal mechanism. Congress would have to act to decide to extend the debt ceiling for a significant period of time or a less than significant period of time or to create an arrangement by which they could absolve themselves of the responsibility in the future. The Congress doesn't usually give up powers and authorities, but, you know, it's up to them. Our position is only that it ought not to be a political football because it's a dangerous political football. And, uh, you know, fumbling that football uh, can cost you a lot more than seven points. It can, it, can, it can tank the economy. It can throw, you know, countless Americans out of work. Uh, and uh, we simply should not contemplate that or uh, you know, engage in speculation about 
uh, whether that's good or bad politics. Uh, it's just bad for the American people. Yes, Mr. Noll, or then Margaret. Jay, um, I know you're against piecemeal funding of the government, and I know you uh, want all or nothing, but when the president today is at FEMA and he laments that 86% of the employees are on furlough, or today you've got the House taking up uh, funding for the FDA, when, when America's health and safety and security is at stake, can't you, why can't you just accept those, those bills and go for all or nothing on what's left? No, the, the, because this is a gimmick. The United States should have an open functioning government, and there is a way to do that, which is if, if Speaker of the House would put his money where his mouth is, put a bill, the, the bill that passed the Senate on the floor and allow a vote, we can test the theory that there are, are more, more than enough representatives in that body to pass it, and then the President would sign it, and then we could negotiate over future government prerogatives and priorities and investments, and how we go about reducing our deficit uh, in a responsible way, uh, which is the way that we've done it thus far. Uh, it is, uh, it is not, the piecemeal is not the, you know, you know, they're only doing this because uh, they refuse to put on the floor a bill that would end this problem for everyone, for everyone at every agency. And, and uh, you know, the, the, this approach uh, represents, I mean, it sort of exposes the lack of seriousness that they're, uh, with which they're taking this incredible problem. So they should just, I mean, what, what is, what is the speaker, I mean, I think Julie or others asked about his internal politics. I, I mean, we ought to, we ought to know if that's what this is about, because otherwise we could, we could, we could, Ask him to prove what he said yesterday, that there isn't a majority to pass a clean CR. And if he's right, then we'll have to deal with that reality. But based on what Republicans themselves have said, he's not right, uh, and we should find out. So let's just, you know, we're not asking for anything in return. The Republicans are employing the strategy because they keep desperately believing that they can you know, defund Obamacare or delay Obamacare or get something else, you know, one other demand they attached at one point to this process was uh, that women across America uh, could only get contraceptive services if they got the permission of their boss. Uh, that was a, uh, a grand idea that some Republicans wanted to attach to uh, reopening the government or keeping the government open. Uh, maybe that's one they'll want to attach to uh, defaulting or the, you know, raising the debt ceiling so we don't default. Uh, our position is simple. Pass a bill, open the government. Pass a bill, pay our bills, pay our debts, avoid, a, you know, end this shutdown, avoid an economic shutdown. And then we can get about the business that the American people want us to focus on, which is uh, debating and discussing and negotiating how we fund our priorities in the future. But aren't you taking a chance? Let's say there's an outbreak of food poisoning. And because the FDA wasn't closed, because the administration wouldn't accept a funding bill, no. the, the, the food F poisoning harms those or, or who have been people. Those who have been furloughed are at home today because the Republicans refuse to open the government. They refuse to pass a bill that enjoys majority support, that enjoys now. majority support in the Senate and enjoys majority support in the House. I mean, that's our position, Mark. And, and I think that one thing that is clear is that the, these, these shifting tactics, all in an effort to, as one congressman said, you know, we're going to get something out of this, we're not, even sure, we're not sure what it is, uh, you know, demonstrates that this is about politics and not about fulfilling fundamental responsibilities. Margaret. Okay. Um, completely setting aside the 14th Amendment and stipulating that the Constitution is the world's greatest document, um, are there <laughs> Are there any steps that the president is considering taking or could take or would be willing to take, declaring a national emergency, finding some other provision under the Constitution or some law to deal with averting a debt ceiling if there's not a statute? There are no off-ramps. There are no off-ramps. Congress owns this responsibility by law, and they should take it seriously. They should act accordingly. Uh, are you saying that there are no off-ramps because the White House believes it would be wrong to look f for executive ways to do it, or because you have looked and there are no I'm saying ways? that, again, when 
you know, ideas have been put forward and we have made clear that those ideas do not pass muster in our legal view. Uh, it reinforces the fundamental fact that the power to uh, appropriate funds, the power to, you know, pay our bills, to fund the government, these are powers that reside with the Congress, and they are not powers that reside with the President. And I, it is not our reading of the Constitution that uh, suggests otherwise. National emergency. <laughs> I haven't really even heard that one. Uh, Here, here's the thing, and it goes to the 14th Amendment question. Uh, it's about confidence and faith and credit. And there is no question that if an action were taken that were doubted when it came to its legality or its constitutionality, that that would put in doubt. Uh, I mean, it's like, it's, like, it's like, would you buy a car if the title was in doubt? Question. What I'm saying well, I think, is but all these, I think, aside, yeah. Well, I mean, you're 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 speculating about some non-existent power. I, I think that, I mean, it, we, we, this the Constitution is the governing document here, and it is a brilliant one indeed. And the, you know, that's that's our read of the Constitution. All right. You just said to Margaret, I haven't heard that one mooted. Is the White House playing out these scenarios? No, no. Okay. I mean, we're not like, right. you know, Congress. I mean, the, the Constitution gives this authority to Congress, and. Uh, in, in, in answer to the specific questions about the 14th Amendment, we've made clear it is our view that, that, uh, that the authority does not reside with the President, and that even if the, you asserted it, you would uh, undermine the faith and credit of the United States because it would, there would be doubt about whether or not uh, the debt that was issued, uh, you know, was it being issued with the full authority uh, here in the United States? I just wanted to ask, for obvious reasons, you guys didn't put out a week ahead on Friday. The President was supposed to be in Asia. It's a very eventful week, and he's in D.C. Can you give us any sense of what he'll be doing? Well, he'll, as you saw today, he's uh, having meetings uh, related to the shutdown. He's having, uh, he had a, uh, went to see some folks at FEMA to talk to them about the, what they're doing uh, in this storm season, as well as the effects of the shutdown and uh, the potential effects of threatening default. Uh, and we will advise you, as we have more scheduling available, uh, to advise you, but yes, you, we were going to be in Asia this week, and now we're here, uh, and uh, you know we'll be uh, letting you know uh, about his schedule and his meetings um, as we're able. So no week ahead. How about the day? I have no week ahead for you. Tomorrow. How about what? The deadline? Tomorrow. tomorrow. Day ahead. Uh, nothing yet. Delay. Two, two quick things, just to follow up on what Margaret and Ari were just asking. Um, you were never in 2011 in the summer. The president got the authority to raise the debt ceiling because Congress gave him that authority, and then there was a resolution of disapproval so that they could actually vote if they did want to do that. But he actually had the authority to do it in tranches. So, is there any thought that maybe that might be a way to get out of that again this week? However, Congress wants to use its authority is up to Congress. That was a solution they arrived at two years ago. Uh, we're, of course, interested to see what solutions they might arrive at this year. Uh, but again, the authority resides with Congress and not with the White House. And, you know, you'll have to ask them about what, you know, you know what avenues they're pursuing to, to ensure that they raise the debt ceiling and don't default. There are so many thousands of Americans who have seen the president uh, either talk to the Associated Press or go to Rockville or they've seen a speaker on television and they're wondering why they're seeing them on TV giving speeches instead mm -hmm. of giving those speeches to one another or talking to one another. Can you just explain simply to the Americans who are totally baffled by this, what would be the harm, again, just explain the harm the president invited everybody again. The way he did last week? Right. Okay. And, and, and did, as Newt Gingrich remembered, get them all exhausted by being in the room stuck together for day after day after day. Two things. The president uh, has and is willing to get exhausted negotiating with the lawmakers over our uh, budget priorities, but not under threat of a continued shutdown and not under threat of default. The economic harm of that is too great. It is, not, uh, it is not the right thing to do for the country. It is not the right thing to do for our economy. And uh, the 
the precedent that people like to cite is 2011, and, and my answer to that is, uh, unfortunately, Republicans used that opportunity to threaten default, and there were severe negative consequences to our economy because of it. Uh, but this President, not using the artificial deadlines of leverage that Congress wants to use, put forward a budget that included the offer he made to the Speaker of the House in December when there was a looming deadline, when, if there was an action taken, taxes were going to go up on every American, uh, but because of the action that was taken, tax cuts for the middle class were locked in place, and the, the very wealthiest Americans were asked to pay more. Uh, but he made an offer at that time, and it was considered a very uh, compromise-minded offer, a serious offer. Uh, and the Speaker didn't take it, uh, but instead of withdrawing that offer, which is what the Speaker did with his own, the President has made sure that that offer remains on the table. And in fact, he built his budget around that offer. Uh, so the President very much looks forward to having those conversations and negotiations, uh, absent the threat of continued shutdown and absent the threat of default. Uh, on, on your question about, you know, the President has been having conversations with uh, leaders in Congress. He will continue to have conversations with leaders in Congress. But that fundamental position uh, doesn't change. And, uh, you know, the, the Speaker has to – remember that the Speaker is now – has now – we're now in our second week of the Speaker refusing to place on the floor a bill that he once supported and said that he would move forward. We're now uh, in a situation where uh, Republicans are coming uh, to speak publicly about their desire to support a clean continuing resolution so that we can reopen the government. There is really no doubt that a majority of the House of Representatives and perhaps a significant majority of the House of Representatives would vote today to reopen the government with no strings attached, no demands from the White House, no demands from Democrats, uh, no partisan demands from Republicans, only the fact that we'd be funding the government at levels that Republicans celebrated uh, for a temporary period of time to allow us to continue to negotiate uh, without the threat of continued shutdown. Thanks, Jay. Mike. Wanted to uh, pin something down here. You said that we could expect monthly reports on the enrollments on the Affordable Care Act. So, just so we can plan, would that be on the one-month anniversary, which would be the first, or mm -hmm. or the next business day? Which I'd refer you to more. CMS and HHS. I'm not sure when that that begins, uh, but I'm sure we'll let you know in plenty of time so you can plan, put it in your calendar. Okay, thanks. Bill. Uh, Jay, on a totally different issue, but one that the President raised. Does he have any plans to attend any Redskins games? <laughs> uh, not that I'm aware of. I wouldn't would he, would he go to a game? Uh, on yeah, a I think the President, uh, asked by our own Julie Pace about this, uh, addressed this very thoughtfully over the weekend. And as a uh, longtime Redskins fan, a native-born Washingtonian, uh, I uh, really appreciated what he had to say. Has he talked to Dan Snyder or have any plans uh, to call him? I don't believe he has, but I don't, I don't have any other information on that uh, subject to impart today. Thanks. Jay, that, Jay, that means that you would want to see the, the name change? Yeah, I just said I was proud of my president on this issue. On the floor of the House, which the Speaker could do today to reopen the government because apparently everyone but the Speaker is confident that that bill would receive a majority in the House and would receive votes from uh, Republicans as well as Democrats. That would be simply doing, uh, would be simply extending government funding at levels that Republicans set. Let's, let's be clear that Democrats, in going along with a temporary continuing resolution to ensure the government wouldn't shut down and now to ensure that it would reopen uh, and allow time for further negotiations. Uh, is not some sort of, you know, fulfillment of democratic priorities. You know that. Everybody here who covers the budgets know, knows that. Uh, Democrats and the President have asked for and believe it, it's necessary to have additional funding beyond the level set by uh, the CR, but have made no demands associated with that. None whatsoever. Zero. You guys have been saying that now we're going into the second week, as you mm -hmm. said. You were making these points before the government shut down, and it doesn't seem to be having a lot of <coughs> impact on Speaker Boehner. And I, I understand, you know, all the points that you're making, mm -hmm. but given that the politics in the House seem to be making it difficult for him to put a clean CR on the floor, does the President feel like there is anything he can do to lay out something specific, make some kind of promise to Boehner and House Republicans 
of negotiations afterwards, something specific that they want that would... ...nation due to the harmful effects of sequestration. Again, the, uh, there are multiple negative consequences to the shutdown of the government, the choice made by House Republicans to do this, uh, and uh, those effects are being felt in this the second week since they made that choice. Julie Pace. Thank you. Um, I know the President has said that he's willing to negotiate with Republicans on a variety of topics after they pass a clean CR and a clean debt ceiling. I'm wondering, though, if the White House would be willing to uh, somehow, in more specific terms, lay out what they're actually willing to negotiate on and maybe include it in a bill or somehow put it in sort of a non-negotiable way to give Speaker Boehner a little bit of cover to maybe take those two votes on the floor. Let me say two things about that, and I appreciate the question. One is, the President has laid out specifics about what he's willing to do and willing to negotiate well, sort of in his budget, terms. which is broad and specific. And the President said at the time when he released his budget that he knew he would not uh, get it passed uh, verbatim, that it, more negotiation and compromise would be required. Uh, but what is also required in this case is a willingness by Republicans to compromise and negotiate. And the President has been open to negotiation all year long, and he remains so today. Good afternoon on this very rainy Monday. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I trust that you heard the President uh, speak at FEMA, uh, where he talked about uh, the hard work done uh, at that uh, agency on behalf of the American people, the hard work that continues there despite the effects of shutdown uh, there as elsewhere, uh, and on the, about the need for Congress to pass a budget, open the government, pass a bill so that the United States can pay its bills, uh, and therefore uh, not continue to do or threaten damage to our economy. Before I take your questions, I just wanted to note that earlier today, the President received another update on uh, the effects of the shutdown from Alyssa Mastromonaco, Rob Neighbors, and Sylvia Burwell. Uh, one of the uh, items that they noted is that in total, we have now seen Head Start closures in six states. Alabama, Connecticut, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, and South Carolina, by seven grantees who operate approximately 100 centers and serve 7,200 children. Now, this comes on top of the 57,000 children cut from Head Start this year in every state in the Give Boehner the political cover to take this step. Your question contains within it, I think, the essence of why Americans hate the dysfunction here. Because the suggestion is that the Speaker of the House can't do the obvious and right thing because of his internal party politics. That, that, that this has to do that this has to do with, you know, his job as opposed to the jobs of those who've been furloughed or the jobs of those uh, Americans uh, who would be out of work if we were to allow or the House Republicans and the Republicans in Congress were uh, to allow the unthinkable, which is a default on our obligations. And I, and I, and I hope and you know, don't want to believe that that's the case, that, uh, you know, the Republicans and, and Speaker have, have said, you know, they've, they've staked out their position that they insist on getting something out of this, some extracting some political concession uh, in return for opening the people's government, in return for paying the bills they racked, racked up. And what the President's saying is we can't do that because that would be uh, putting in jeopardy the, the stability of our economy for the long term. And uh, it would do great harm to our democratic system if every time it was necessary for the United States to take action to pay its obligations, uh, when it comes to how we make our choices to fund our priorities and our budget, do make those choices in a way that ensures our economy grows, uh, make, sh make those choices in a, in, a, in, in a way that ensures uh, that our economy grows uh, in a manner that most helps the middle class. Because uh, the stronger our middle class, uh, 
the better the country does. Uh, that is what history has taught us. So, you know, the door has been open all year long, and and you know, again and again and again, uh, Republicans uh, have, when it came to the process in the Senate and the House that they demanded, refused to appoint conferees for that regular order to continue and for the negotiations to take place there. And even in the meetings with the President, some of which were very productive and thoughtful, uh, Republican lawmakers never came back with a compromise proposal of their own. But he is ready to do that, just not under threat of shutdown, not under threat of default. Uh, those are fundamental core responsibilities of Congress that they need to fulfill. Uh, and he won't, you know, allow the American people and the economy and the American economy to be held hostage uh, to ideological demands uh, in return for fulfilling those simple functions. Let me also say that when it comes to putting a bill 